Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? In this episode, we talk with Anthony Ashnault of Rutgers University. Anthony was a 2019 NCAA champion, four-time All-American, and three-time Big Ten champion. He currently trains with Scarlet Knight, RTC, and is part of Mob and Media. Be sure to head over to barbarianapparel.com slash BA hour for singlet specials. Hey, what's uh Okay, so just real quick, we're going to kick off with, uh, is it Dragon Nationals, Anthony? Yeah, the Dragon Nationals was a youth event that we streamed on Mob and Media. Uh, that, that, that happened um, about right before trials, like May 28th, I want to say. April, April or uh, March 28th? March, uh, March, sorry, March. Uh, March 28th. Uh, uh, who's at the event? Who was the big names at the event? And how many, what was numbers like? What, what did it look like for you guys? Um, so the, the format of the tournament was kind of unique. Um, the tournament was March 27th. Um, and 28th or or just the 27th i forget i'm not too sure about that timeline because i was really preparing for trials so i'm partnered up in mob and media we had an interview back at the spire institute when i was training for, with uh, team usa over there in geneva ohio you came by for that training camp but uh my partner eliezer deluca he ran uh that tournament the dragon nationals and um the format of this tournament was eight elite national level guys from kindergarten to eighth grade um separated by weight class but just one division and get eight guys per weight separate them into two pools of four where they'll wrestle three uh three of the other guys and then in the other pool four they'll wrestle three guys and then everyone will make it to a bracket format not just like fargo where you cross over so then they enter the quarterfinals based off how they did in the pool play um and then actually it was, yes, it was a two day tournament. 27th was the pool play. And then the 28th was um, where they wrestled that bracket. And it was cool to see some of the guys that maybe took second in the pool were in the finals versus the guy that didn't win their pool, that won their pool. And uh, it was an interesting tournament for sure. There was a lot of really good youth hammers. Um, you know, some of them boom ranch guys from Tennessee came out to Jersey to wrestle um a lot of the guys that you see in these tournaments and cadet in the cadet freestyle world championship trials that just ha- or world team trials that just happened if you go up and down that list um a lot of those kids were at the tournament seth mendoza lost in the finals he was at our tournament um dude seth mendoza is an absolute <laughs> hammer yeah. yeah oh my goodness you talked about where was he at zeb you've talked he was about at him. hold on he was at defense soap duels he was at national middle school duels. I seen this guy at a couple national level events. Is he, I think he wears a Crown Point Indiana. I think he's from Crown Point Indiana, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I thought he was from yeah. Illinois. Yeah. Did he have the big throw at defense? What was the dude? He had a big kick, kick in the tar out of everybody at defense. So <laughs> the dude is an absolute hammer. Yeah, well, and, he uh, lost at your tournament. Um, no, I'm saying he lost this weekend at oh uh, yeah 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 U23. How did he do it your turn? I'm pulling tournament? up the results because uh, I was definitely watching the tournament and really tuned into it, but well, I wasn't. Tra- I you wasn't were training, so you were trying I mean, to win. Yeah, talk I was about playing, that. I was talk planning on winning the Olympic trials, man. I was yeah, talk about for that. that. And, yeah. uh, it, it's cool to have this other venture, but I I have to be able to be kind of all in on my Olympic journey. I can't be at a – no offense, I would love to be there, but I can't be spending two days full of energy – uh, focusing on running the event leading up to the week before a trial. So uh, I really put it in the hands of my um, partner on Mob and Media, uh, Eliezer DeLuca, and that's who runs the site with me as well. And um, he did a great job. He got all the kids. He ran the tournament. He rented out this facility, Sportica, which is a giant sports complex. Um, and, of course, like there was things we did together, whether it was renting different things, and that, that venture has been cool. It's, I've been doing a lot of learning about – um, how to organize and put together an event and make sure it's ran effectively with different timing of when the finals are going to be, when are you going to bring the 
uh, sports production that gets all the lights or the tunnel. When are you going to set that stuff up and separate the tournament on top of getting the kids and forming relationships with these kids? That's been the, the best part in my eyes. I mean, one day I want to move into college coaching and, and beyond that, I want to be able to have a impact on as many kids and tell them about my story impact their, maybe their journey, um, make it a little bit better, maybe enhance it, uh, maybe progress them faster than I progressed. Um, so that I get a lot of enjoyment out of that as well. And uh, that that Dragon Nationals tournament was kindergarten through eighth grade. I wasn't there, but uh, in the in the build up to the event, I got to know a lot of the kids. I followed them. We had other events, more like dual meet showcase events where they were in as well. Um, and we've had really good guys come out to them. Other a little younger guys like. You had Bo Bassett. You had Bo Bassett on the event. We did have. We were supposed to have Bo Bassett at the Dragon Nationals. Um, something came up for him where they had to back out late. But uh, he was in he a was duel, in a, though. He was in one of those duels, wasn't he? I think you. I think it was like a, a another Rockfin duel for PA Power or something. I'm not really positive. Dude, he's in a ton of stuff. Uh, Mitney Lion, he was in, I believe. Yeah. How would that go with your? So the Dragon Nationals was streamed through Rockfin. How'd that go partnering with them? It's been great. They've been, uh, you know, just through their platform, they give us the ability to do a lot of things on our own. Um, but, you know, it's still hiring the people or, or doing it yourself to run that tournament, put the streams together, put them on the site. And the one thing that was still difficult is running multiple streams. Like just like we thought we had very quality stream speed and uh, connection speed and everything with our internet, but just with the full, with, whatever kind of like I, I had a high school tournament in February, which I was a major part of. It was called the mob and classic. And that was the first time we kind of tried to do four, four streams in the same gym on Rockfin on four separate uh, sites because they didn't have the, I guess they didn't have the ability to do four streams like um, out of our own live site. So we, we partnered with different people like that. I, I grew up lifting with this guy, Zach Evanesh. He has an underground gym site. Right. One mat was on that mat. We had, um, we had two two that were able to be on mob and media so we put those two but the thing about it we were doing all these different codes and different streams it just made it lag uh and there was connection issues and uh definitely not even close to as the dragon nationals got a much much better um from that short window of about a month and a half and then they were at the dragon nationals they were able to do six mats all on mob and media live but on separate tabs so like it could, it's not a one drop down menu or not like a one click off menu um, where you could just kind of get to each link easier, easily, but you can put six different tabs up at the top of your computer and be able to follow it. And that was the last platform we got. Um, ideally, hopefully it could get to the point where you just kind of like have a mat tab and you're like mat two, mat three, right on your same live stream. But um, outside of the live events, Rockfin's been great and it's been everything we could really ask for. And it's given, me an opportunity to to grow as a person and to grow myself in the in sense of uh my business so it's been awesome it was probably easier to view than the than the trials right i heard a lot of feedback on that trying to that cheese right <laughs> oh just, my goodness the trials the trials jersey states as well man uh was jersey states rough mm -hmm. it was frustrating to be on the one on a side that you you are running these events and then you're watching something like that and you're like dang like like, you know what you put into yours and you're like, why are they not doing more or why are they not doing it better? I, hear I guess that, what was the trials like? I had to have for the finals for the. The three final mats, I had to have three different devices. Just to so make sure I watched your nation match and I watched your I watched like two or three of your matches. The Nation match is the one I remember the most because it was a really good match and you got him in the end. I appreciate that. And it was that. close. I won I won. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But I appreciate that. No, I, I was pumped. I was pumped about the Nation match. Yeah. Um, and credit to Nation. I mean, he jumped, he made a pretty big jump in weight from when the, there was the flow duel where he was 57 kilos up to Russell Hugh. You know, yeah. a cast yeah. like you. And he's a freak, obviously. He's yeah, so and his double, He hit me with like a couple straight on doubles from space in it. It was powerful, even though it's upper weight for him. I, I don't think he was able to get through me like he would a guy his size. A couple times, just like I was just a little too big for him to get through. And he definitely had his hands on my legs maybe at one point. But I felt that power, and it was it was good to feel that speed, you know. Um, 
that's a style that I do struggle with a lot of times, those explosive dives, because I think I try to kind of stay at that at that length um, and hit some more slick things. So it was a good style matchup to challenge myself going into that tournament. And I thought it set the momentum pretty well for me. I was excited and uh, I was excited to wrestle Zane. I thought I had a great opportunity on my hands. You battled, though. You battled yeah, with Zane. For sure. Dude. I for mean, sure. there's no doubt about it. You battled. And the other thing with you was, you know, the first time I actually got to meet and hang out with you was uh, out at Kevin Roberts's in uh, North Idaho, wa- you know, Eastern Washington. And uh, you did the camp. You came out with a torn ACL. Oh, you had a repaired ACL. You came out. You did the camp. And I'm like, why is he out here? But you still, you know, gave it all you had at the camp. I thought it was a great experience. I mean, for you, because you're learning more about coaching at that point, right? Yeah. And you say that's the future aspiration. But, you know, getting to know you there, I was like, oh, man, this guy, this guy, you battled through some injuries. I mean, it was a long journey for you, man. And, and, and Jared actually brought it up. You came back for a sixth year to win your NCAA title, right? Yep. Yeah. That, yep. Is, that is wild because a lot of guys in their sixth year, they don't normally come back because there's been so much stuff along the way as far as whether it's out of wear and tear, right? Yeah, yeah. Wear and tear the whole nine yards. And, um, you know, and I, I like to, to bring up the, did you tear your ACL against Dean Heil or was your hamstring? Uh, I tore a part, partial tour of my hamstring in my freshman year there. Dude, it was but, so uh, crazy. I was on the mat for it and I was like, why is he still going? Yeah. Yeah. Stop it. I felt like, I kind of felt like a deer, a wounded deer, like limping away from the, from the sniper. But, uh, no, it was like one of those moments where, you know, you envision maybe coming back for third or or like I was in the backside at that point my freshman year. You, if I lost both my next match, I took eighth. And, um, you know, I just felt like it was a winnable match. And I could have went on a little run in the backside. Uh, and I, it was frustrating a little. But, you know, I was blessed to be an All-American at least. So I just wanted to finish the match. I kind of knew I was going to have to forfeit from that point out to finish eighth. And I was just kind of trying to finish the match and, have some pride and dignity in myself getting that getting that all-american for the first time and then to come back for the sixth year you know that's your that's your was that your redshirt freshman year yeah that was my redshirt freshman year and then uh um my senior my supposed to be redshirt senior year uh i had shoulder surgery uh for torn labrum and um bicep tendon repair that happened at the university tournament that going into that season so leading up to the sixth year, you were eighth, sixth, fourth, right? I was eight, fourth, sixth. Eight, fourth, sixth. Sorry, I messed yep. the order up. But you'd never left an NCAA tournament with the win is what's wild about it. And to come back for a sixth year, the shoulder, and then, you know, all the things you battled, and not to mention Father Time's undefeated. I mean, what was it like going into your sixth year? Did you have a lot of pressure? Did you feel a lot of pressure? I actually like felt like I had a lot of clarity because when I first got that surgery uh, for my shoulder, which was the first major injury, the knee happened after my college career in the world team trials in 19 versus James Green on the leg lace. But uh, that major shoulder surgery going into that, my supposed to be fifth year of college, I dealt with a lot of those mental, like those mental times where it was very difficult to want to come back at all. I had a question. Do I want to coach long term? Do I want to move on to, from the sport? what do I want to do in life? And it was like, up to that point, it was just, I want to be a national champ. That's all I really know. I don't really care what my major is. Let's just find a way to be a national champ. Um, like in sense, I was just not blinded by it, but that was my mission. And I felt like it was very, um, very possible. I went to Rutgers with that mission as well, to like to turn that program around, not that it wasn't turned around, but to continue the progress that we were making to be, to be the first national champ was a big goal of mine. And those were things that I thought about daily and had saved as my goals on all my reminders and writing them down as well. And just things I was constantly reminding myself. So thinking about getting that surgery, my shoulder surgery, I was like, first, the first time I was taken away from that thought for a little bit. And I was like, what am I doing this for? Do I really want to do this for me? Or do I want to do this for Rutgers? Or do I want to do this for my community? And you know, not that I didn't have that self-talk, but, uh, you know, I thought I always kind of did think about mental training, mindset training as maybe a little bit weak-minded to try to even do it. And until that point, once I started enter- entering that kind of thought into my life, it was like I started questioning a lot of things and learning a lot about myself. And 
when I finally got over the hump and started feeling better about surgery four or five months after and started lifting again and doing more intense rehab, I just slowly got my confidence back about myself and about my wrestling. And it was very clear to me that I missed wrestling and I loved it. And the more I was away from it, the more I was like itching to just be on that mission again, whether it was just to be the best in the world or be a national champ or make a, make a difference to the people around me. Uh, the only way I know how to really make that biggest difference is through the sport of wrestling and uh, just going through the down of a, of a big surgery and almost being out. You feel like you're out. Maybe, maybe, you know, there's a bunch of people that come back just like I did, but everyone goes to that point where they're like, I might not, not be able to be the same ever again. And uh, getting over that hump, I was good. Then that by the time I got to my sixth year, it was like, it was a blessing. Every match was fun. I didn't think about it. Like, um, I needed to win the national title. I was like, damn, like, I'm so blessed. I got a sixth year. And if I win, that'll be great. And I'm definitely going to try to be fun and score a lot of points. But if I lose, I'm going to have the opportunity maybe to compete for world teams, Olympic teams. Like that was my plan. And um, now I'm here a couple years later and it's been, it's been an awesome ride. You talk about getting into coaching. Did you learn anything from your coaches, you know, going through those ups and downs? Yeah, I think I did. I definitely did. I also was going, I went from living at college to living at home my last year of school. So it's like, there was a lot of things happening in my life, 22 years old at the time. Um, and I think we're all at, all at that point when you are supposed to graduate college at that age and you're moving on with your life and doing the first thing, first time making money or anything, or going to these camps around the country. And I have commitments and a big part of going to that Kevin Roberts camp was, yeah, it was cool to get paid, but in, more important to me, I made a commitment to him and to back out. I didn't really feel like um, it was too late in the process. Like I got surgery right away and it was just like, if I backed out, it would have been two weeks before the, the clinic or a month before the clinic. And I think I just waited that like the too long to tell him. And I was like, I can't back out now. I was nervous about it. Um, I just wanted to honor that commitment for sure. So my coaches did, I guess you said, did my coaches teach me anything going through those injuries? Um, I guess kind of like commitment to my team. They definitely taught me um, to be around my teammates, even when I couldn't maybe participate or be in practice, you know, just be aside, uh, kind of be like another set of eyes if anything was happening and um, going to th going to those clinics at fast forward that's after college and even in college I was doing doing those kind of things they taught me a lot about how to run a practice how to manage kids how to run a warm-up uh how I could be most impactful whether it's wrestling with them or talking with them and learning a lot of different personalities where kids are kind of from you know you're doing these camps in different areas that you grew up in so you learn a lot what is over your left shoulder like right to your left by the Adidas sign is on your left, I think, on your sleeve. Is that your bracket? What is that oh, on yeah, your left? Yeah, oh, show me. Is. Pan over to the bracket. Come on. I can't. I can't. <laughs> My can't. I have a desktop, bro. Um, it's a desktop. A you laptop. can't. You literally can't. It's, I don't want to unplug anything. And then no, it's... don't, don't, don't. But that's the, that is. <laughs> who is that rat tail it's wrestler? Actually, it's actually on. Uh... Can you see the mark? You can see the mark. I can see the rat tail. I can see the rat tail match. You can see this mark. No, I can see the rat tail match. That's it. Uh, at the bottom. The rat tail. The, the Russell N match. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's 32 versus it? 33 or what it was before. Yeah, it was. Parker Cropman versus Tanner Smith. There Russell you go. Round. That's the. That's all. <laughs> I can <laughs> see that. That's <laughs> it. That's sweet. Though. That's good. Yo, right up above it, I have uh, – this is like um, – I don't know. They're like concrete walls, but they're like – they chip easily. I don't know what the material is called. Plaster, probably. Plaster, yeah. I'm not too. I'm not too handy, so I just drill, tried to drill right in the first day. You just said hack chunk. it, hack with it. Yeah, nah, I didn't. I tried to cover it up, but then the bracket wasn't centered. It didn't look right, so I just left the mark <laughs> and moved the bracket centered. I love it. <laughs> Was that just like a spare bedroom? Uh, yeah, we got a two bedroom apartment here in Red Bank, New Jersey. I wish we had a backhand on this thing. We over, we got a nice view of the water here at the Navasink uh, or Navis Navasink River. So it's a good it's a good spot out here, man. It's like thirty five minutes to Rutgers, uh, right up the Garden State Parkway. How far to Princeton? Um, pretty far, probably like fifty minutes. Cause don't you have to go there sometimes, like one or two days a week when it's normal times? 
Yeah, they're training out of a wrestling club right now called Rhino Wrestling Club, where uh, the kid Anthony Knox trains out of Rhino Wrestling Club. He's a stud that we've tried to get at our little kid events. Um, but it, they're training out of there right now, and I'm mostly stuck to Rutgers. We were in this COVID situation where we tested and this year. We tested every day during season, and if I left that bubble while I – like at one point I got COVID and had – kind of a window of 90 days where I could go train at other places in a way. But while I didn't have COVID ever and I'm testing every day, if I broke that bubble, uh, it made it complicated to train consistently at all. So uh, and you can't do that leading up to Olympic trials. Right. You just so couldn't do it. You couldn't afford well, it. It's kind of like, like you the, get your in the beginning, in the beginning of COVID, it was like, we could train somewhere. Like, what do we got to do? Like, <laughs> it was just an exciting, like to be in the Rutgers wrestling facility. It's like, trials or no trials at that point it was almost still thinking in september october you know you're like is there is this olympic games going to be canceled like you're still you, i was just blessed to go train and to be around the guys a little bit more uh that was nice but also you know yeah that's the mission so you don't want to jeopardize being able to train for a solid three four or five months and uh go risk that for the team as well you know they're going through a season they're they're sacrificing themselves hopefully keeping themselves in the bubble in and out uh, and I didn't want to take away from them, you know, which did happen to one of our guys at Rutgers. He failed for COVID right before uh, Big Tens, and he had 11 days, but the Big Ten had a special rule where he was supposed to sit 17 days or something, and uh, they didn't let him wrestle. So Was that your 57-pounder? Yeah, this kid Rob Kennard, freshman 57-pounder. He was ranked like f probably 12th or 15th in the country. Jeez, yeah. so crazy. See, my the big thing I we me I thought was gonna happen, and you know, talking to a lot of my friends, there we were like, man, they're gonna pop someone at NCAs, and then they're gonna contact trace it all the way back from the semis, and they're gonna have to eliminate all these dudes, and it's gonna be a mess. And it, it didn't happen, man. It didn't happen. I was, and you know, it was just like negative Nancy and me coming out, but I was like, I was like getting, I was preparing myself to be so sad. Yeah. Yeah, and then I mean that situation with Soriano at trials, it is sad. It's like, right? He like yeah, makes that's all, right. He, ma he makes all these sacrifices, you know, in his eyes to have a better training situation to go to these tournaments overseas instead of wrestling the college season. I mean, he made a lot of changes in his life to get to this point, and then it got stripped from him. I I feel pretty bad about that. Uh, in hindsight, you know, I I wish. I wish it, it could have been a better system, but what really is there? Are we gonna we are we the sport that could get a bubble for thirty days? Probably not. Yeah, like no. so, it just doesn't make no. sense. Other other than what they did, and it's just unfortunate. Anthony, can he come back to you guys next year? He can um, he come back. I he think could definitely come back if he wants to come uh, back. Yeah. I think he could come back whenever. But uh, I haven't had much communication with him since he's been to uh, Arizona State. So um, he's been training out there with some kids kids and um i don't know if he has interest in wrestling for them or transferring schools like um, i'm just under the interpretation that if he wants to finish his college career he either has to graduate from Rutgers to be able to have a transfer or come back and finish it at Rutgers for his last year eligibility this year um you know i don't know where his head's at after that something like that happens do you want to um, go compete right away and just kind of like put your head down ncaa season or work there's a world championships that maybe he wants to do that route so uh i'm not sure it's crazy it's crazy because it would be his third d1 and i know that we just had that the the guy who totally beat in the round of 12 from kent state mcnally mm -hmm. he he's at his third d1 but eastern michigan dropped for him to come to kent state and now he's going to wisconsin as a graduate transfer so he's got that and all those odu guys old dominion guys they have the same situation where some of them could they could go to a third d1 but it's because they came from a drop program. Soriano's not in that situation. Obviously, Penn State, Rutgers, and now potentially, like you're saying, Arizona State. But like you're saying, you don't communicate with the guy much. So, but I mean, well, we he got that. Like he got that special. Week. He got that special transfer from Penn State, right? When he first came to Rutgers, yeah, there was like a special transfer. I remember you had to go through. Maybe that makes it an excuse. Yeah, leave, you never know. Transfer I mean, leave? I don't know. I don't even want to really. What's going on, right? Yeah, I mean, we just don't know. But the, the one thing about him, though, he's kind of like, it's crazy, like, even like me or like anyone, it's just like, he's Cal, like, Chael Sonnen's talking about him today on YouTube. Like, he's a, he's a mystery. Like, he's, Chael Sonnen's asking Kyle Dake if he knows about Nick Soriano. Like, that's just funny to me. I'm like, nobody knows about this guy. Like, he's just, 
Dude, you were teammates. You made history. <laughs> you were on a billboard together. You guys won the first two NCAA titles in Rutgers history. You don't even know anything about this guy. You don't even wow. – you guys are both from Jersey. I mean, it's bizarre. It's I mean, like, I could do some anomaly. intel. I could do intel if I wanted. I could hit him up directly if I wanted – if I want to. Um, he, he, I'm not saying he, I don't. He knows where his head's at, right? I, I'm not saying he, I don't. I'm just saying – Right. Uh, I'm just following the timeline. He went to New York uh, training, New York Regional Training Center when, when he was starting to compete at first with Valentin, and you know he stopped really coming into Rutgers, and you know like it wasn't any disrespect why I don't text him and ask him what's going on. I just haven't, you know, he left to Rutgers to go there, then he went to Arizona State. I don't, I don't really fully understand what the issues are that like I that this, I love this place, man. I this is my home and. He didn't disrespect me ever and dis- disrespect uh, much about Rutgers besides leaving, but I just I just don't understand. It kind of feels like he might think that we did something or, or something happened, but I don't really fully understand what did or what went wrong. I'm worried about you. I'm not going to lie to you. That's great. We can sit here and speculate about Nikki push-ups or Nikki dips, whatever we want to call them from now on. <laughs> but I, want, I like hearing about you and your future coaching career and and what you're doing now, you're building a, a media brand, but eventually that's going to shoot it off into probably a, either a coaching club, a kids club. You know, Logan Stever's got Stever Elite. David Taylor's got M2. I yeah. definitely see you having you drawn enough water in Jersey to go to a club if you wanted to, or if you want to stick in the college ranks. I mean, you you know, you got a lot of forks in the road coming up here. Whether you're going to do another quad or not, you know, and the Open's coming up, right? Are you mm-hmm. going to enter in the Open? No, I'm not doing the open, you know, uh, I kind of took time off. Not, I didn't really stop training. I trained with some of the college guys, some high school guys and some guys leading up to the New Jersey state tournament. Um, but, uh, right now I'm just not ready to compete again right away. And I could probably still make 65 kilos, which would be nice to go compete there. But I qualify for the trials, um, standing that I, that I qualified for this year's trials. Uh, I believe that's a qualification into the, world team trials this year that are going down in uh, September. So if I want to compete again at that, that'll probably be the next competition. Um, and as, as you said, you know, it's complex, uh, but I, I feel, I'm, I feel pretty strongly that I'm going to be moving into the college circuit of coaching. Uh, right now I'm just an RTC athlete. And as much as it's great to work out with the guys, I'm definitely not like their coach and I'm not, in that mindset because I'm very, I'm very selfish. And I, it, that like kind of makes me like, like take a step back. I don't like love that feeling of being super selfish, but at the senior level, like I'm really thinking, is this what I need to be doing is do, like, there's a lot of things in the college practice or college conditioning or lifting that are different from what I'm doing in my, in my training schedule. So I was pretty selfish through this year, especially being an Olympic training uh, year. And I didn't really have my hand in helping the guys and, um, it made me like definitely feel that feeling I want to be coaching and uh, being able to coach all the little guys are great and running a lot of little kid practices and events and being a part of uh, like volunteering at a, my brother's high school. He coaches a high school in New Jersey. Um, that's awesome. And I have a hand on those kids, but I want to be at the highest level and I want to be on the college level. And uh, right now I would say I want to be a head coach one day. You know, I want to figure that out in this next kind of stage of my life and figure out if this is what I want to do long-term. But right now that's kind of how I see my future. If you ask me what I'm doing in 10 years. Is, is MMA out of the question? Yeah. 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 I, I think I father, some rumbling I think, that you might think about that. Or... <laughs> yeah. I think just father time got me. Yeah. Say, yeah, yeah <laughs> that's my question. You, you know, know, I definitely want injuries. to continue. I'm definitely planning on continuing wrestling at 65 kilograms, 70 kilograms, um, hopefully there's these events that have been going on during COVID and quarantine at first that were going on more often. Uh, hopefully they pick back up in the summer and that'd be cool to have some events. You know, ideally I've talked about it with my buddy Eliezer a lot. Like we want to have an event where I'm wrestling in it. And we're almost at that point where we know who, like all the kind of different people we want involved in running our event, whether it's whoever's producing it, whoever's get the light people, whoever's the venue people or whoever's, managing the clock workers and table workers like because right now we do those things and if I want to wrestle an event like I can't do those things you know he can't do those things 
Uh, so who would, you wrestle, who would you wrestle? Who do you want to wrestle one of those events? I would want to wrestle somebody cool that like I don't have the opportunity to wrestle, like maybe like a Tyler Berger or Kingishvili. Um, yeah, but there's plenty of Americans who who, who want to not just uh, wrestle, but you know, I want to be able to give back to them as well, whether it's paying them or giving them a, a platform. It would be really cool too to wrestle international guys and bring those guys in. Uh, but it would be awesome to build our own athletes as well. Um, we we want to do things like maybe like get these club teams involved, like a club versus a club. Uh, and it would definitely be awesome to just keep it in house and support SKWC and make sure uh, like our Rutgers RTC athletes are getting all these events. That would be really cool to happen one day. And um, like, hopefully we could get to that point with Mob Media, but right now, you know, we're just do not playing our part, but, uh, we're doing what we can do and we're doing a good job. We don't want to load our plate too much. Um, we want to keep building organically. And when we could afford not, not just monetary, but when we, when we could afford, whether it's time and energy and uh, other people involved, when we could afford to move to the next step, like then we'll do it if we can. If we can't, then we'll, we'll keep staying in our lane. So you keep using the selfish talk. You know, to be an Olympic athlete and wrestling, you know, such an individualized sport, you do got to be selfish. There's no question about it, but you're like the least selfish guy. You're such a giving guy. When I think about it, like I get that what you're saying is like, do your rehab, um, obviously recovery, nutrition, you got to be selfish about all that stuff. Your training, your weight training, your, your running, your cardio, all that. You got to be selfish. I get that. But dude, you're, you're giving, you, you gave my kid his first interview. Yeah, you, you treat how you treated my sons was like, this is the least selfish guy here. You know what I mean? Jaden was awesome with them too. Colin Moore was awesome, and how you treated my kids, I'm like, I was like, I think is this guy's a people person. Yeah, he loves to give back, you know, and you really like to give back. But I get what you're saying about the selfish talk, right? Like all the stuff I just explained is what you're saying being selfish about. But as far as giving, man, I don't know if there's more giving guy out of the state of New Jersey that I've ever met. Man, you are like you're out there. You put yourself out here. And I love that. I, I, I like, I taught, I was talking to my brother about it today. I'm like, dude, you got to watch this interview that uh, Anthony Ashnell did with uh, Ferdinand. He's like, really? Ferdinand did. I go, yeah, he's NCAA champ. He's like, hey, my brother's, he's kind of oblivious, but I was like, he beat uh, Mickey Jordan in the NCAA final. Oh, he beat a Jordan in the final. Then it's like, here's perk up. Right. <laughs> and then he started you know, with that. Then he knows. Right? So, yeah. If I'd have led with that, then you'd have had a lot more clout with him. But like, you know, in talking to it, you know, you're just such a, you know, a caring, giving guy. You were engaging my kids at the beginning and the end of practice. And that's not easy to do. And you don't have to do that. Right. Yeah. And that like, for someone like me, that really sticks with me. You know what I'm saying? Like that, right. You can't, Zeb, you've seen a lot of coaches interact with kids. You can't fake that. Right. No, you can't, you can't. Yeah. And, and it's just like how he was treating kids. Really at the, uh, that, man. The, the Washington camp was awesome too. There was this dude that was doing the moves with uh, Drew Roberts. And you were like, come on, man, this is a big time camp. You got to step up your game. And the <laughs> kid was just like, he was stiff. He wasn't doing what you were doing, asking him to do. You weren't, you know, you gave it to him a little bit, but it was like, come on, man. And if we're going to use you, you got to like step up to the plate here. And I like that. <laughs> I like the honesty too, though. You know what I mean? Like, I like that. You're not sugarcoating stuff. I like that. So that's like, that's what shows me that, man, you, the future's right there whenever you want to be. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, and that, and I, I like that. I enjoy that. That's something I think my parents definitely instilled in me for sure. Coming from a community where, you know, you start people like the we have high level wrestling, but our wrestlers don't really go to club until they start at five years old. And we stay in in our PIL system until really like eighth grade. And I think people start to maybe wander to clubs at like sixth to eighth grade. But the development of most of the guys I grew up with in my town came from the older generations giving back to the younger generations, whether it was fathers, whether it was cousins, whether it was uh, the kid, the other, the previous South Plainfield high school wrestlers, um, as well as, you know, I looked at the high school athletes in my town as superstars when I was a kid wrestling. And I was a pretty high level wrestler at, from five to 12 years old, but I looked at, and I didn't look at like date, like uh, at that time, maybe um, Ed Ruth or, I don't know. I'm I'm blanking out on who the guys were. Andrew Campletano was it in New Jersey. I oh, yeah, remember. he was my he's kind of my age though. It's unreal. He's a little older than you, right? Yeah, he's I mean, we overlapped for two years. M Mike uh, Gray. Mike Gray was Mike Gray, definitely. Was it, definitely. Right? 
Yeah. Who's yeah, the guy that wrestled for Buffalo, Jared? The 57 pounder. He was like a four time Jersey Buffalo. State champ. Yeah. Lieb Black. Who, who wrestled? Tolar? Tolar wrestled? Yeah, Tolar used to wrestle him. He was like a four time New Jersey State champ, I think. Yeah. Absagami, three timer. Three timer. He was really good, <laughs> though. Yeah, the school Absagami, they were really good at that time. Kid at Tinney High School. I don't know if you guys know them, but of course. Of course I've heard of that. Come they on. They were hammer schools. And okay, so the big schools there are obviously Bergen Catholic. Bergen Catholic is, I mean, they Del always Barton. got a hammer school. Del Barton actually is best just, school this year, it, probably. Right? I'd say Del Barton was the best school this year. I mean, they did teams, they do do team points like on track wrestling, but they don't. Is officially... Gray from Del Barton? Yeah, he was with Del Barton. Uh, they were good then, but they weren't the best. You know, they had like four or five good individuals, but not a full team. Now gotcha. they have a bunch, like now the worst kids taking sixth, seventh in the state kind of thing. Okay, um, so so Del Barton, Bergen Catholic, Ber- Brick Memorial. Brick Memorial is really good. Dude, I remember this second. guy, Mike Morales. Second. Yeah. Mike Morales was like a thug that wrestled for WVU. Dude, he was tough, though. I wrestled him my freshman year. Dude, he was, he was really kid. tough. He tried to fight me. I don't know why. I just think because I was like. <laughs> I, I was literally like the told young, you he's a thug. I was wrestling uh, as a freshman, you know, and he was fifth-year senior, and he was like. He was the he was a king in Jersey, but I was the young guy. I think he just took it personal a little bit. He's, he's a good dude. He's Rick right? Memorial, right? He's a really yeah. Uh, I no, you're, so. you're missing it. I'm not saying he's like a thug. Is like a dude that goes out and commits crimes or slings. He just dope. wrestles hard. He yeah, just wrestles yeah. hard and didn't back down. No, he's mobbing. He's mo- he's mobbing. <laughs> I like that. He's mobbing. That's for sure. He's mobbing hard, but like. Just like I look at some of the programs, man, there's just like junkyard dogs everywhere. And you guys don't obviously Blair Academy doesn't mix in with your regular state. And how was the state this past? Because It's one division. Yeah. So uh, there was different this year. You know, usually we have districts and the top three from districts make it to regions. And the last couple of years, they changed regions to top four, making it to states. But um so top four from eight regions usually make it to states, which is 32 guys. This year, they seeded the district tournament, but they didn't wrestle it. They just took the top guys from the districts that they seeded out, and they skipped the district tournament. They made it into only four regions, so they call them super regions, and the super regions only got 16 votes into them. So whatever the seeds came out for districts determined those 16 spots at the super regions. And then top four at the super regions made it to the States in a 16 man bracket. And that just went down uh, Saturday. They did all half the first seven weights. And then Sunday they did all day, the second seven weights. And um, they did it differently in the region tournament, which I kind of liked. They did it like all the whole tournament from 106 to 126 wrestled from 9 a.m. to like 1 p.m. And the whole tournament was done for them. And then the next weights came in that same day. And so they, they did, did like a quarter four of the weights, a yeah. quarter of the weight. Wow. I mean, and, and I love a 16 man bracket. It was. So you had to still wow. wrestle for, and if you made it to States on the backside, it was a grind of a day. Holy oh, smokes. Wow. But I kind of liked it. It was entertaining. But they cut a the step family. out. It was what you're saying. They cut a qualification step out. Yeah. Yeah. They which seated I was you kinda, and however, whoever got seated went. I never got to the full point. It just, for me, thinking about the system, like what about the freshmen or the upper weights that are sophomores to juniors that just maybe turn in the corner that didn't, because a lot of this got, they had, some of them had six matches, seven matches. I got seated off of last year, years before previous. Um, I mean, they did have some votes that got in for younger kids, but I think maybe some kids got left out that would have had chances. Not that they would have made a splash, but you want those kids to have an opportunity. Wow. Wow. You said you want to talk about that. And I was like, I want, I was like, oh, all right, sure. We'll talk about it. Yeah. I didn't know that. And PA only had eight guys at the state tournament. Wow. Did you know that? No, what was it? Divisions. They still did districts, region states. They did something weird. It was really because yeah. Hannah, Hannah Mears was telling me about it. And I like, I have such a, I just, I can't even wrap my brain around some of the PA stuff, man. They do some of the most backwoods things I've ever heard. I'm like, what are you talking about? I think they only had eight at the state tournament. Did you guys have to wear masks? They had to wear masks, right? And they had to wear masks. We did not. No, no. How did your guys' state tournament work? We, we, uh, that was the only thing different was just not at the arena. It was in a high school. Yeah, and they split it. We didn't split to force, but I can't get over a 16 man bracket and what? 
a half of a day. We did half our weights on, you know, half a day. You know what I mean? So they split it lightweights, heavyweights, you know, um, sectionals, district, state, or states, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so right. seven yeah, in the yeah, morning, well. seven in the afternoon, seven in the morning, seven in the afternoon. But the finals were all all 14 weights in all all three divisions. We're at three separate high schools in the Columbus area. So it felt like it felt like a district for us. Like yeah. state felt like a district. So it wasn't yeah, my nephew won the state, Anthony, and um he pinned his guy in the state finals. He's a 195 pounders, a senior. And I was, you know, I've told a bunch of people, uh, I told him I was thankful it was in a high school gym because he didn't he'd never been to the state tournament before. He never been. He's never made a state uh, tournament. Before. It's in the show. You, you think he performed state. better because it was like a, a little bit of underwhelming. Yes. Yeah. yes, it was underwhelming. Exactly. I think that about the Jersey States, the same things. High school gym, only parents allowed. It was like underwhelming. When you see the celebrations, it's funny, and you're like, dang, like, why they? Man, they're partying hard. What's going <laughs> on? Why is that dude celebrating so hard? Yeah. But it's like the culmination of everything they've done. Oh, for sure. For their whole it's a life. Great moment. It's right. a great yeah. moment been there it's a great moment but you know yeah i mean it's crazy and you know what's great about this this podcast right now we got two four-time state champs on here and then you got me <laughs> jared's a four-time ohio state champ you're a four-time jersey state champ that's the first you, you this is the, the first jared isn't it uh maybe i don't know yeah okay, we haven't had eric Burnett on you talking yet. old news yeah, that's you got cool. mike gray on here ever no we haven't had mike gray on um yeah it's he, me who are your gray, four-timers Andrew- me, Mike Gray, Campitano. Um, I feel like someone else too. And Soriano. Nick Soriano. Nikki push ups. Oh. Yeah. Nikki push ups. Nikki, Nikki. So I lo- my favorite no one was Nikki Balboa. What's that? My favorite one was Nikki Balboa. <laughs> Dude, the guy's an anomaly. These things where he's doing dips and push ups, he's at playgrounds doing it. He's a freak, though. Yeah, he is. And when you wrestle with freak. him, though, he's a, he is a freak. For Total sure a freak. mutant. Total mutant. Um, okay, so New Jersey State, um, could you guys go at all? Could, could Good Ale go? Could no, Hank it's still go? the dead period. I could go. That's right. I could have went. Like, if my brother wanted me to be the second coach or something, I could have maybe went. But uh, he didn't want me, I guess. <laughs> he didn't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I was at a bachelor party in Austin uh, for for one of my buddies that was a uh, All American for UNC, Troy Howman. He took fourth in uh, 2018 at 149. So we were at his bachelor party. So I couldn't have done it anyway. But we were all watching because we all have kids that we train. He works at a club, Triumph Wrestling Club. So he has kids. So it was fun. We were following along. It was complicated though. Like you were saying about the trials, the the stream was not. Uh, I don't want to say it was definitely clean and it wasn't, it wasn't choppy and it didn't cut out, but it just was like difficult, difficult, difficult to follow. Hard to navigate. Yeah. Like you in a perfect world, it kind of looks like flow where you could have the bracket on one spot and the live streams on that website. So you could either press the match live or it says Matt four and it's easy to go back and forth. But um, it seems like all the tournaments that we're doing right now, it's like, you got to follow it on track wrestling. You got to find what math they're on. Then you got to go back to the website that they're streaming it on. And that's what we have to do for our mob and media events right now, which is frustrating. It, it'll get better. I'm going to tell you right now, that'll get better. If I know one thing about Martin Florian, oh, it's no, going to get better. And that's why we have, we had opportunities to maybe put some of those events on other platforms and, and do well off of that. But, then we'd be selling out on our product that we kind of bought into and gave us the opportunity in our eyes. So, uh, so we want, we want to believe in that as well. And we want to hold on to that. Um, we believe that Martin will find a way to get this to the next level. Cause we think that's what he wants to do too. A hundred percent. They, they yeah. sent an email out this week talking yeah, about I saw that. they're making. So it's, yeah. it's coming. Yeah. It's coming. Especially with the track. You can't, you can't be on, you can't be on the website and be, not believing in that because you know we're getting paid in ray coin you know what what would it be like if we didn't believe in that and we're just collecting this coin like then we're kind of contradicting ourselves 100 percent. so so you're a big crypto guy i'm not but this has made me a, like at least involved in it and had to learn about it in the game to, right 
yeah, I'm in the game now and it's awesome, bro. I, I was in, uh, I was in this to like the stock game for sure since I started making any money and just putting money into that. And, uh, you know, I felt like I learned kind of the system is not too much different, but it's definitely a lot different in terms of regulation and following when they're going to jump, when things are going to jump or move around. So, uh, I'm happy, you know, I'm happy to get paid in, right. It's cool to have that, uh, that just, you know, venture. It's like a different saving account. hundred percent. You should bring Palacio on to uh, run all your Ray. And, and I he wanted, can, I wanted to reach out to him, but he can take the train over from, from strong Island. He's living in Miami now. Is he living in Miami? It looks like it. I don't know. I mean, you can never Ch- tell. Chine, I, never, I don't Chine know what that guy's doing. Miami. You see that Zeb? Chine just moved to Miami. Oh yeah. It's Eric Chine was like the number one uh, party planner in uh, Vegas. And then apparently Miami's, the warmer Kent State and, guy. Yeah, yeah. He's, he was Florida, around the 12 guy for Florida's Kent. open right now. Florida's open and then yeah. um they just did the uh they released the congressional districts and California lost a seat. New York and California both lost a seat in the uh in the United States House of Representatives which goes off the the census and and we know why they lost a seat because the states are the two most restrictive states. And people have left both of the states in the millions. You know, you have a lot of New York people who've moved to, they've moved to Florida. And you have a lot of t- uh, California people who've moved to Texas. They follow the Joe Rogan route. They, they want Joe Rogan, uh, what's his name? Elon Musk route. Yeah, they did that. And a lot of like what, if Palacio did move, I don't know if he has, but there has been a lot of that. People have actually left Manhattan and moved to Florida and migrated down there because it's, well, first off, can you blame them on the weather besides the, the hurricane season second off i mean when you can go and do as you please i mean who's really going to argue with that you know as long as people are vaccinated or whatever and they can move freely and they have events and you can go watch baseball games and football games and you know ufc events you know fifteen thousand people yeah, right. got to watch that yeah what'd you guys think about that did you think when you saw that like crazy or did you think let's go like let's move this forward Let's go. LFG. <laughs> LFG. It was optional, right? Right. You didn't have to be there. No, that's, everything's I, an option, I, dude. I, I mean, that's how America. I thought. Of, I thought about that. This whole situation, like that, from the start, I was like, well, like at least let me have that option to go risk myself. Um, you know, but I see in your bottom of your screen, Zeb. You know, defense soap. If you stay clean, wash your hands. Shout out, defense soap. <laughs> I hooked you up. Yeah. Have it before. Yeah, you it? did. I, yeah. I think I asked, more. You, I asked you if I could get some more and you didn't get back to me. Dude, I, now, now I gotta, you gotta text me your address. I don't I know. Take I gotta check the, I don't know if I actually did ask, but. <laughs> oh, 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 you, you just hit me with, that was a, like a, that was almost like a, it was like what you, you Long Island be, but in a Jersey fashion. Yeah. Snake Scam me a little bit. It's okay. Snake you. <laughs> <laughs> the PA term that those no, that's that what your boy, P- that's what Ferdinand calls his half Nelson. Yeah, right? that's right. He calls it a snake. <laughs> Ferdinand calls it because Coach Barney, our uh, the their youth coach, calls it like a snake bite, like snake bite. It's a good, it's a good term for the little kid. Yeah, Barney. Shout out to Jeff Barney. But like, yeah, man, it, it's just it's crazy to think that a lot of the personal choices. And then here in Ohio, um, our governor just got overrode this month. I think it was this month it could have been last month hold on it, it it equates out to 90 days all of his orders go null and void all these health orders go null and void so it's like june 25th i want to say which is 90 days from when our our state legislature overrode all of his orders so it expired after nine so yeah that was just it was just this month right april may june yeah so or the end of march actually the end of march all of his orders are gone. Well, then, I, you know, I've been talking to people and they're like, well, you're still going to have people who are going to wear masks because it's optional and it should be optional in my opinion. You know what I mean? And I understand wanting to protect others. Right. And that's why you get vaccinated, but masks should be optional because there's people yeah. that, you know, have health problems and then they don't have to explain it to somebody and get yelled at and there's these arguments and it's divisive. So if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask, go nuts. Yeah. At, in Texas, a lot of the spots are kind of optional, but people are, for the most part, you know, you know you shoot, mask. You can, yeah, there you go. Um, but most of the time you go into a supermarket. I've been in Texas twice in the last month and a half based off uh, this recent trip and then trials. And 
I've been to targets and different places and most part, most places, if, if they're optional, still those kind of spots have mostly people in masks. So um, what's Bob and do mask mask up. I mean, you had to, I mean, I, yeah. you'd ought to, almost would have been irresponsible going into your Olymp- Olympic dream in my opinion, but yeah, you do you right. Definitely. At that point I was free. I'm still in a period where uh, I'm 90 days to the point, like not, May 5th, I think is the day of my 90th day where I'm going to have to enter the testing pool to enter Rutgers facility again. So, you know, I'm saying mask up, but in my mind, I'm not threat. I don't feel threatened right now. Um, I feel invincible, not, but I feel you like had, I'm, you, <laughs> said you had it though. I did have it in February and it was nerve wracking going like training was going really kind of not, not, I'd say ideal, but you know, you're about to make that last push eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks out. And I got it right about that point. So it was like, shit, like I'm in really good shape. My weight's great. Um, I mean, it was, I got hit pretty bad, which was good and bad, bad in the fact I was nervous about my lungs coming back, but good in the sense that my weight was still low when I came back. So I just had to gradually, like, cause it was a big diet change and a shift of shrinking my body a little bit to get like under 55 and get to 153. The weight class is about 143. 0.4 for the Olympics at 65 kilograms and um, doing during that process you know I was training throughout it so I was nervous you know if I didn't get any effects and I'm just sitting at home for 10 days of course I'll work out but it's just different when you're in on, on a routine uh, but I came back probably lighter and it was just about slowly working my way back in those first couple weeks even though it wasn't a lot of time I didn't I got hit hard with this that with the COVID I was feeling like I had the flu and all and just the flu symptoms in general like fever sweats the whole night for about two two three days it felt like that and then it was just kind of like a bad cold so it was cool for like six days but uh getting to that point just made me fear like i felt like i just did a little bit of damage to my body so i was nervous about coming back fast i took not my time but i didn't wrestle the first week i probably did some like cardio on bikes and I was hitting like we have a Jacob's ladder and um, uh, Versa climber and mm-hmm. one of the ski ergs and a ski uh, thrower ski as well. And I would do different challenges, get trying to get different amounts of calories in certain time. And some coaches like Joe Pollard put me through different workouts. Uh, and then it was like slowly, like, let's grab a, a, a less quality college guy and just kind of do what you need to do for the hour, hour, 15, hour and a half until you work your way in to finally being able to go into practice again. And that was probably like a two week process, like from February 15th to like the first week of March. I remember hitting March 1st and be like, I didn't care how I felt. I was just like, it's go time. Like, let's go. Um, It's time to turn it up a little. And that's when about the time the Ohio camp was coming up and I scheduled another little mini camp. I went to Cornell for two weeks and I was training with Yanni and Henderson got to go with Dake. They have a, um, a Canadian freestyle wrestler, uh, Javon at 74 kilograms and uh, a bunch of other guys. I was wrestling with Vito a couple, couple of sessions. So it was awesome um, to just mix it up. It was about good timing. That was like, I fast forwarded a couple of weeks, but that was like the last hard camp. And, you know, I, I put myself in a good spot. I recovered from COVID absolutely fine. I felt like a beast going into uh, the event trials and, you know, I wrestled pretty well, but it just didn't end up how I kind of envisioned it, how I hoped. Where do you go from there? You know, you don't, you don't get on the Olympic team. Uh, and the other thing is obviously the thing with 65 kilos is the weight wasn't qualified and hopefully J.O. can get that done. Right. I mean, really, I mean, I, I listen, man, I'm an American and I want our weight qualified. You know that, I mean, I, there's no haterism in me at all, man. I want all the, I want all six freestyle weights. I want all the Greco weights. I'm an American, you know, I'm a <laughs> Homer but knowing the weight wasn't qualified that obviously didn't change your mindset at all. You were just like Olympic team, get on the team, do what it takes. You don't get on it. Yeah. How do you react? How do you regroup from that? What's it like your conversations with good ale with, um, with the rest of the staff? Uh, for me, it was about like, what's the next step for me? Like you're saying, like, am I, do I want to keep competing and is the goal to win the world championships and be the best in the world is the goal to be an Olympic champ and, set that for a four-year plan 
uh, like, where's my mindset going to shift? And that was the questions I was starting to ask myself. And um, the answer I knew that was there is like, I definitely want to start coaching uh, at the college level. So um, that was more the shift of talk in my mind. I was like, let's get on to the next thing. And for a short term, like that, it, I have to get that set up and I have to make that transition. Um, and in my mind about the wrestling, I was like, I need a little break, just the, the build up to the event of trials, um, going through COVID and training through it. I, I had a, uh, a pretty serious back surgery uh, last summer in August. And that was a really hard comeback to make sure to even be ready to train again for trials. So Did you had a back surgery. What'd they do to you? I had a L5 S1 uh, microdiscectomy. I had a, a herniated disc. Um, could you feel where your hands and legs go numb? Just like my whole left on from my like lower back down on my left side of my leg to so like about re replaced. Is that what that means? I don't know what the, the microdiscectomy thing, the yeah. process. It, well, I had a lot of sciatic nerve, like Zeb saying, like that's like sciatic nerve pain. Like right. I had pain from my lower back to the back of my knee. For so they like just creep the out so the scar there's, tissue. There's like your discs are in circles, I think, right. uh, down your spine. The bulging disc is kind of like like bulging out this way like so they shave that brother part just out. had his neck done they shave that part they like shave that part out okay. and these are like nerve walls that you have to break oh to do that God. so they sewed the nerve walls back up and that's really it that's the okay. surgery dude okay. you so, love pain you love pain <laughs> you're out of your mind and you love pain no <laughs> uh, i love wrestling and i i, I know you do I, but you love always, pain. like I, as a kid i always saw myself as winning a state title and then the next vision after that was, can I be an Olympic champ? Like, let's live that mission out like that. The first question I asked as a kid, when I was curious about the sport was like, can I be a state champ? How do you be one? How could, what's, what's my like plan to get there? How can I surround myself with coaches and athletes to get there? And then the next big thing after winning the freshman state title was like, shit, can I be an Olympic champ? Can I be that good? And it was since then the missions in between to be an all, all American and national champ came and went, but really my, love and when i was in that fifth year deciding if i even wanted to come back after shoulder surgery was i want to be an olympic champ that's what really drove me to come compete again and be the best in the world so you're constantly learning right you're talking about learning what what are you asking your, yourself right now to be a good college coach uh the big question i've been asking myself is just is it possible to compete at the highest level and still coach um and you know you look at examples at other guys that tried to do it and maybe failed other guys that did it and succeeded. But uh, my passions are different and everyone's a little different. And I already have my, my hand in coaching in different kind of youth sectors and put my energy in different baskets. And if I hone in those kind of energies into college coaching and learning different things about just, I mean, I know technique, but I'm not a master of coaching it. I don't know. The perfect way how to deliver it to a student yet or an athlete um, and how to properly navigate those waters of different conversations with different personalities like I'm not a professional at that yet so um, I'm looking forward to learning about that and just you know realizing that there's no perfect way or no one way and just because I'm I did it one way and I accomplished some things one way at Rutgers doesn't mean every kid on that team is going to have that same approach uh but there's definitely things I'm looking forward to that maybe through my journey, I'm like, I could have done it better here. I could have been there faster if I did it this way or didn't do this or didn't do that or did this harder. Um, so I'm excited about all that. I've been asking myself those just kind of things like, how can I compete while I coach? What's that situation looking like? Um, and it's cool to have not just the NGRTC, but SKWC supports me and supports the other athletes like, Ethan Ramos, who trains for Puerto Rico, um, uh, Sebastian Rivera, he's competing for Puerto Rico and going to last chance qualifier. Uh, we have a guy from Tashikistan named Kamal, uh, and we're going to have Miles Martin coming in, and he's going to train there as well. So not just me, but they support us in the training, and um, it's only going to get better, and we're growing as Rutgers, is, as our progress has showed in results at national tournaments year after year, uh, constant All-Americans at this point, and it's only going to be better and grow. So I'm excited about building that. And, you know, as much as my goal has always been to an, be an Olympic champ and have that dream, like my goals shift and my body changes as well. And I want to, I always wanted to, the moment I 
came to Rutgers and decided that I wanted to change the program forever. And that goal, I now get to live out. Hopefully, hopefully it's at Rutgers. I get to live that out in the coaching realm um, to hopefully push that even further and maybe one day want to be like the head coach leading that program into uh, whatever we're going to like, hopefully we could be one day being top three national champs year after year. And um, I believe in that. I've always believed in that. And that's why I came to Rutgers over schools like Penn state, Michigan, Oklahoma state, Oklahoma. Um, so that's where I'm at with that. So is September world team trials your last tournament or do we see you for another quad or is it year by year, three months by three months, <laughs> six months by six months. No, I'm definitely how, how do you there. at this point? Yeah, I, I have no injury that I should retire from right now. I have the potential to compete with the best guys. Um, there's no reason for me to stop competing right now. Um, like I don't, I'm hoping that it goes all the way through that to the next Olympic cycle. And I hope to make it to 2024. I just, um, I feel like right now, like that's not guaranteed in my life. Um, and my passions go through different things like I want to put my all into this coaching venture whether I'm an assistant coach wherever I'm at you know I want to put my all into that and if that leads to me maybe feeling like you know I'm not all in on competing right now and I can't I can't go win right now at this level because I'm focused on getting my guys better coaching but if I feel confident and there's a system in place where I could have an RTC to train at during that time and I'm working out and getting my workouts in and able to kind of be a coach when I'm at practice and go be an athlete when I'm at the RTC, then that's a situation I could see myself competing at 20 at September trials. I could see next year's open, you know, whenever the team kind of wound up not to wrestle, if I could make it to the NYC tournament, that's a close one. And I would love to wrestle for three more years and make it through 2024, you know, but it has to be the right situation. And um, for me, I have to be locked in, you know, if it's not the right situation, which you know, I've been through times in the senior level where you're kind of on your own at times. Um, and I'm just a little bit older. I need resume. I need a resume. Like I need a consistent schedule. So if it w isn't like that, then I probably won't compete. But if it's like that, wherever I'm coaching at, then I'll compete. What is the relationship between Rutgers, Scarlet Knight Wrestling Club, Princeton, and NJ New Jersey RTC? Because you keep, you keep bringing up SK Scarlet Knight Wrestling Club, and then you 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 also bring up NJRTC. How does that relationship work? Obviously, Reese is the head coach, but what is how does it work for you personally? And then how does it all work with two obviously premier colleges and universities? I mean, Princeton Rutgers. I mean, we got the Big Ten, we got the Ivy League. It, it, it's a club coaching like it, it, it's the hotbed. It's one of the best yeah. clubs. Yeah. How do, how do the two, how, how does it all interact? Yeah, so uh, SKWC has athletes like that. I went through that. They kind of fund through, um, you know, fundraising through mostly like Rutgers alumni and donors. And it's a Scarlet Knights Wrestling Club. It, that's the name of it. And uh, Princeton has their athletes that they kind of fund. And all of us were represented under the New Jersey Regional Training Center, um, whether you're paid through Rutgers or paid through Princeton. It's just an agreement. And Reese is the head coach for the New Jersey Regional Training Center. And, you know, before, co before COVID, it was practice like four or five scheduled times a week. And that was Reese's kind of run practice. Like two of them would be at Princeton. Three of them would be at Rutgers, flip-flop next week. Um, and that, that would kind of be the schedule. When COVID hit, they started working in this Rhino Wrestling Club. And and I was not really going much because I was just staying with the Rutgers guys. And so this past training cycle for the trials, my coaches has really been who I've been working with were just uh, Joe Pollard, who's the director of ops and SKMC youth coach. Um, and the rest of the college rest coaching, the coaching staff would help out when they were kind of around our workout times, but the most part him and he, we would kind of bring in the different college guys and different people from the area, you know, Nestor Tefer. Uh, was a guy I trained with a lot towards the end uh, of my like training cycle leading up to trials. Um, but there was different guys like Eliezer DeLuca. He was a 149 pounder in college. He trained with me a lot too. Troy Howman uh, trained with me a lot. Um, there was a lot of guys that helped me out. Um, 
Kladzik. Was Kladzik around? Kladzik. I went. I would. I would go to the place Rhino Wrestling Club, but I. I like went like two or three times in those couple months leading up to trials, and I did get to go at Kladzik and. Um, the one time, I, he one time he kicked my ass in practice. I was kind of pissed, but it was a good pissed. It was like a, it was like a damn like, kids. I, as much as I just want to beat him, I love I, I want to beat him. He's a great kid, and he always comes ready to scrap. But uh, I was just coming back from like the Cornell trip, feeling great about myself. I was competing great against those guys, who are the top guys in sixty five kilos and all their weights respectively. So I was like kind of coming in that practice like a little bit, feeling like top of the world feeling and. He put it on me a little bit and I was just like, all right, well, like every day, you know, you better come ready to work, kid, or you're going to get your tail whack. But uh, it. it was good. You know, he's a great guy. I would actually like to moving forward, like be able to train with him more because I think I fought that feeling a little bit, you know, in college we're training, we're wrestling every year, twice a year uh, for big moments, national semis, duel on the line, Rutgers, Princeton, outside on the football field, he beat me in the last couple seconds in front of 16,000 people. Like we've had some battles in sense of big moments, but I think we both highly respect each other. And, you know, when we're in a room together, we get along like we're buddies. Like we're sitting next to the wall asking about different things. And when we're training, we're asking about different things, what you're doing, what I'm doing. And um, I would like to hopefully be able to move that even further along and be able, be able to train with them even more than just two or three times leading up to trials. He's an Ohio guy. Of course, you know that, right? Yeah, I do. But I mean, Blair guy too. So, you know, yeah. he's a Ohio guy. He really he's Ohio State most, champ. He developed the most. I, I know he actually, he like would travel in Ohio when he was in like seventh, eighth grade to different high schools, wouldn't he? And, and he was the only guy on his team. Yeah. He just the only guy on his team. He transferred to Blair after he got to high school. He won, No, he won a state title as a freshman for Miami Valley Country Day School. And, uh, Daniel was a three-time state champ there, his older brother. That's my brother. Daniel did. Daniel he, and wait, Troy used to wrestle. He be, did he beat your brother ever? I think so. Maybe he Troy beat Scott. your brother at the state tournament? Freshman year, maybe. I could be wrong. So, yeah, the Kolodzik are they're from the school, Miami Valley Country Day. And then it's – They're the only kid on their team. They're the only guys on the team. They're the only two guys to ever wrestle for that school. How many people go to that high school graduate uh, class? Probably not enough to start a fight would be my guess. <laughs> but what they could do then by our rules in Ohio, they could go practice with any team. Yeah, so he probably, yeah, I think it was a gram. He just went to gram. Right. Because he did all the Jeff Jordan camps. And what's crazy is he's probably crazy close with, with Mickey. He said he would train with him. Yeah, that, no, no, he did because they're from, that's the same area. No, like even in college, like he would go home when he went home, like they so would train wild. together. It's so wild. Yeah, he would yeah. probably be home from break, and he'd go over to the the old man. Jeff Jordan would throw some logs on the fire. He doesn't really have a log fire, but he does in his house. But, Not like, he'd probably get the room all that. hot, yeah. and these dudes would all just, like, kick the tar out of each other. Alex Marinelli, name some dudes, you know, name some Graham dudes who are probably tougher than hell, and they would probably do some crazy uh, high school practices at Graham, at Jeff's. Jeff's got like three locations. Jeff's like, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a setup, dude. When you know, when you get into coaching, it's obviously an area you're going to have to hit. Oh yeah. But wait until you see how much is not around it. You're going to be yeah. like, yep. Zub was not lying. It is <laughs> worse than Geneva, dude. Ohio. What's that? Worse than Geneva by the sea, by the lake. Oh, Ohio. oh Geneva <laughs> by the lake is New York city compared to Shan- no, no, County, bro. I'm not, I'm, you don't, don't even know. know. Yeah. You're going to have to hit I it mean, though. I Just mean, right. if, if I was working at Rutgers, you know, it's like, I would also be like, is a kid from this area going to make it at Rutgers? It's a lot different of a life. It's so different a place like that to New Brunswick. New they Jersey. don't even know what a toll road is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're going to be like, I didn't Maybe bring lost. enough change or easy <laughs> pass or dollar bills to get through all these, these, these tolls. They're not going to know what hit them. Okay. So listen, I got to get it down to, my guy, Artie and Ramadani, he works over there. He's a Newark. He works for the New York, New Jersey Port Authority. He's from Garfield, New Jersey. North Jersey One of our guy. college teammates. He's a state placer. He's third in the state for Garfield. So you know he's gritty because Garfield's gritty. Yeah. He broke his neck. Didn't he break his neck? He broke his neck. He broke his neck and came back and took third in the state. He was he in a halo, his- dude. Wait, like he wrestled with a broken neck? He was third in the state, he was in a halo. He recovered and wrestled, or he wrestled through a broken neck? 
he recovered and wrestled. He broke his neck in football. Impressive. And he was in a halo. And and he was like, oh, yeah, I remember when 9-11 happened, I was in a halo. I was like, what? He was in a fixated deal. Like, they had screws in his head here and here, so he couldn't move his head and re-break his neck. Who's that? The but this that dude. Like that. Say it again. There's a boxing movie that uh, I've seen recently. I forget the guy's name. That he got messed up and he came back like that. Dome screws in his head. Artie's out of his mind. Yeah. Artie's out of his mind. But you know, he was tough. He had a really good double leg. He was, but listen, I want to go I went back to Thanksgiving with him. He's the only person in his family that's born here in the United States. So of course they're immigrants. Uh Albanian or uh, uh Macedonian. <laughs> Man, if I mess this up. I messed this up. He's going to fist fight me or double leg me next time I see him. So they're from Macedonia and they're like these dude. It's, it's wild. But anyhow, Adian. The, Adian, yeah, <laughs> good dude. So anyhow, I love hearing about Atlantic city, the, Jersey. <laughs> the New Jersey state tournament. I wish oh. I wish it was there. It wasn't there this year. I know. So yeah, because uh, everybody's like these little Ohio guy people. Got into wrestling. Like his little guy placed in the yeah, son. The son's stadium. like my Ferdinand's age. He'll probably double up Ferdinand and do his back and pin him. But um, <laughs> it's but, a journey. It's a journey. It's, it's, a, journey. <laughs> it's a journey. They're five. <laughs> Anyhow, um, talk talk to me about how magical of a place that is because I've seen that arena. Yeah, isn't it? Is it attached to all the casinos too? Is it attached? It's not attached, but it's, it's not in, attached. It's like it's right, right there. It's right in the center region of like walking distance from all of them, uh, and it's on the right on the boardwalk, so it's pretty sweet. Uh, it's pretty cool, man. It's like an old feel, old school hockey arena kind of feeling. It's almost like a war coliseum. Yeah, that's what I yeah. think of. Like, like, I'm like a it, war it felt, coliseum. It feels like it was like a storage coliseum for like tanks or something, and they just like brought bleachers in and made it a hockey arena, but. Um, Dude, it's, a it's cool, cool. it's a really, cool, it's really cool and, uh it's a big deal in new jersey you know growing up when kids aren't wrestlers in big school and like from big schools like my town all the kids that weren't wrestlers you know they were planning parties to come to the uh, to the states for the weekend they were like <laughs> that was the event like that was that was it atlantic city <sighs> states weekend like and thankfully you know i'm wrestling through it all for my four years so i'd never experienced that side of it but some of the coolest and most fun stories from my friends in high school come from those weekends uh you know they like they treated it like um like a getaway you know even our parents and i think that's what was so mystical and cool about it like everyone from coaches to athletes to friends to fans it was just an all-in experience like we're going to Atlantic city three days in march see you later like Spring break you know yeah and it was Spring on a friday sa- it's a friday sa- friday night saturday sunday event so you know people don't miss things you know you don't miss your regular life you get back to it not that most of those people doing the other extracurriculars probably felt great on monday you know but you don't miss much either so i think that's what is so great about that event uh but i I was thinking about like watching it and the kids celebrated you know that made me think we were talking about before they're celebrating to an empty crowd right now that's tough. You know, it's tough to watch. It's like, it just, you feel bad for them. I know what I got to experience and it was awesome. I, I hope they get back to that for next season, at least. And we get some normalcy. Who were your titles against? Who did you win your freshman, sophomore, uh, junior, senior year? Against? 103 versus Tyler Fraley. He won a couple Fargo titles, Greco freestyle. I believe both, but. Uh, Let me guess. Did seven. Tyler Fraley go to Drexel? I'm making that up. No, I think he went to Clarion and then he went to like Clarion. some some juco or naia school okay. and actually might have won nationals i'm not sure but uh, uh okay and then sophomore year mike magaldo uh 112 i don't know and, that and then two years in a row gary dinmore from hunter and central he wrestled that uh rider penn, penn state then rider yes yeah i remember him at rider yeah i guess some of the other more notable guys like richie lewis was in a couple of the weight classes and uh, Chad Walsh, you know, world champion Richie Lewis. Yeah, well, you W U twenty three world champ, uh, pro professional MMA fighter. Now, did you guys see his fight? He won, didn't he? Yeah, he did win. He looked good. He wrestled. Uh, I, I he wrestled, just saw that he just won. dominated his guy. 
but he had his first pro fight went right into pros so it's pretty impressive um fighting richie lewis Miami. is a freak he is he's definitely total a, freak total gifted freak, athlete total one of a kind uh gifted athlete for sure powerful man have you been to a uh, have you been to a, a Ohio State tournament? Have you been to a PA state tournament? Have you been to Illinois? Have you been to another state tournament yet? No, no, I haven't. What's uh what was Ohio like compared to what it's usually like? What it, is it usually it's all usually you guys have those divisions on mat next to mat for the finals yes. and the place. Yes, around, right? three mats in the finals this I've year it was watched. just one I mean, final. I've watched all of those. I've watched those events on different platforms and I, I can I they're on flow usually right yeah I, I don't that, I'm, that behind don't, the camera. I'm not a fan of the yeah. flow I usually did yeah I did those for the last like I've covered that event since 2008 with that's when I started that's when I started doing the flow wrestling stuff yeah 2008 with Martin Floriani the first event I ever did was Ohio State tournament he like asked to sleep on the floor underneath the kitchen or the bathroom yeah, sink. And the dude was a savage, like out of his mind. And that was how I met him. That was literally how I met him. Actually, I met him at the UWW 23 under Akron thing. Yeah. I thought he was a homeless person. <laughs> I remember you telling me some of this. Out of, gave this dude a ride. That's fire. Yeah. And he told me some crack crackhead story and i was like yeah okay bro we're gonna be as big as espn and i was like oh well maybe you should worry about getting a shower first buddy <laughs> hey don't judge a book by its cover <laughs> he's he was sometimes, a sometimes he still looks like he's like you know what this is me <laughs> i just don't think he cares he <laughs> yeah he not care, care at all nope. he's not care at all but like are you a hardcore jersey or bust we're the best state in high school wrestling is that are you is that I a hill say, you're gonna die in? i mean like this year I was more into the New Jersey state tournament than the NCAA tournament. Like I was following, I have kids I'm invested in, whether I trained them or I know people coaching them and I'm excited for them and I know their personalities and I want them to win. And, you know, I, it was harder for me to be that excited about uh, the whole NCAAs, but I was, and I don't really get like that about many tournaments besides like Olympic trials or world team trials. I get really excited about different brackets, like a fan. Uh, but New Jersey States, man, I'm like a fan. Like, I'll always be a fan. As a kid, I was the kid writing out the brackets, following every results, you know, scribbling in the names, trying to complete the bracket pa packet um, so I didn't have to buy the updated version the next day. Uh, so I've just fell in love with the Jersey States. That'll be premiere for me. I mean, I'm not dumb. Like, I don't, I don't think it, every year it's not the best. I'm sure we have our years where we match up to be the best pound, pound for pound in the nation. But there's definitely – most years, I'd say it's probably Pennsylvania um, being the best between their different vision, divisions, but they have multiple divisions. So, you know, we could have an argument in that sense, but then you got years where Ohio's really good. You got years where California's really good, years where Iowa's really good. Um, and some of you guys have divisions, Iowa, you guys, but um, even Indiana's, I feel like, has had really good years. Yeah, no, you're, you're right on it. Indiana, it's a sleeper. Illinois, obviously, has had yeah. some great years as well and then obviously minnesota but how far is south plainfield from uh sicklerville uh jordan burroughs yeah um like an hour and a half he's like he's like atlantic city south jersey um not on the coast but just that gotcha. south i'm like right in the middle of the state um you know there's debates in new jersey is there a central jersey is there just north and south so, you know, I would say I'm in central Jersey, but uh, some people don't say that ex exists. <laughs> central Jersey's <laughs> Narnia doesn't exist. I love it. <laughs> uh, where, you, you look, where are you at, Jared? Are you in a wrestling club right now, or is this your home office? This is my home office, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah I'm in uh, right on Lake Erie in Sandusky. So, like, an uh, hour and a half west is um, Cedar Point. I've never heard of Cedar Point, but. I like it. I got to do a little basement. background in my setup here. Yeah, I got a, it's all set up for in-person. I got some uh, in-person ones I have coming up. Here. Nice. Okay, Bobbin, give me a quick, I don't know if you want to grade it, but how do you feel like you're, you didn't make the Olympic team. I understand that. But how do you feel like you competed at the Olympic trials in Dallas, Fort Worth? Um, well, compared to how my competitions were going, um, I made a lot of jumps and leaps like I really felt if you bring me to January 2021 going into like that Yanni match coming off the flow wrestling tournament the flow wrestling 150 tournament 
Um, I felt like going into those events, I was at the top of the world. I came back from back surgery. I was like crushing everyone in practice. I was feeling super confident. And then that's my real competition. And, you know, I just kind of forgot how like mentally I approached competition and how I prepared uh, to when the whistle was going to blow, how I was going to perform, you know, I was wrestling great in practice and that's great and all, but you know, I wasn't fully prepared to go into a competition right away. And it took time for me to um, get over those little hurdles and feel confident about it. So after those little lumps, you know, I got teched by Yanni in January and, you know, I got to turn that around and expect to beat him in a couple months. So I made a lot of changes and whether it was changes in training, change, changes in how I was living or going to different camps to train with these guys that are at that level, what, which would make me feel like um, giving me like that more experience or even getting matches with those guys, you know, was, is a great feeling for me to fully understand how I, how hard I have to wrestle or what positions um, I'm getting exposed in. Um, so I did all that and I felt great going into the tournament. And I think that nation match was my first round match nation. Great. I felt great. I, I think I could have attacked a lot more in the first five minutes, but the moment I felt like I had to pull the trigger, I got the takedown and I dominated the center for most of the mat. He got me on one explosive takedown, but for the most part, I was just controlling him and I was waiting for my opportunity. Uh, it was a big moment, the first match right after weighing. So it was just wrestling my match. And I felt like I did a great job in some of the tactics I was trying to apply. And then I wrestled Zane in the next round. And again, I thought I wrestled pretty great. I uh, got to his legs a lot more. I felt like than he was getting to my legs, but it was just like, not full conviction. I felt like, I feel like looking back on it, not full conviction and belief that I was going to score once I got to his legs. It was more like shocking, like, which I felt like I took a huge, huge steps back because in my senior year of college and even after that, like I, I took the mat, like I'm going to, I'm going to pin everyone I wrestle or I'm going to at least like, that was the goal of sport. Like I was there to score points and I was able to get into that mindset where I was like, I'm just going to go for seven minutes, whatever long the matches as hard as I can, as many positions as I could get to. Um, and I felt like in that Zane match as hard and as good as I wrestled, I didn't have that little bit of an edge where I felt that way. I was more just trying to pick that one or two opportunities where I could go score and, you know, versus the best guys, you need to just go and you need to, you need to be able to let it fly. Um, and I think looking back at my tournament, I wrestled great and I wrestled hard, but I didn't fully let it fly or feel confident to let it fly. And I need to get back to that point. And I lost to Zane five, one. And I had many opportunities to score and win that match, which is great looking back at it. But the whole, in the whole picture, I just feel like that was really the reasoning and how that match went. And then I, I bounced uh, into the backside, wrestled Evan Henderson, a guy I beat at the flow wrestling tournament a couple months before that. And I felt good. It was just mentally, you know, it was all in the same round and that morning round. It was hard. Like, hell no, did I, did I want to wrestle? No, like, I was like, shit, I just got my dreams taken from me. Like, do I have another four years to do this again and go all in and be all in on this mission? And uh, like, you already, you get hit with those thoughts immediately. And to have to turn that around in 30 minutes and go out there and wrestle, like, I was definitely able to get over it and be like, you know what? Like, I'm one, I'm watching these guys drop out of tournament left and right and forfeit out. And I'm like, one, I'm never going to be the guy to tell my kids to do this if I can't do it. So I'm step like, I'm freaking wrestling. Like, I don't care how I feel. I don't like, cause I didn't feel great. Like I felt like I got freaking blasted by nation in the first match had to head a little bit woozy from that, but I was like, whatever, like, you know, it's time, it's time to go. Like, this is the Olympic trials. You lost the match, try to come back third and make the national team. And I, the next thought I had was like, how am I ever going to tell a kid I'm coaching it's time to come back in the backside if I don't do it myself. Like, what kind of example is that? So those were the two thoughts that kind of got me back on the mat. And then uh, the match started. I, I don't really remember how the first exchange happened. I believe he got a takedown. And then I, I got a great little dump single that I ran through, had him on his back for about 30 seconds. And I was like, just he was, in my opinion, he was super, super flat. I've never really had anyone flat like that in freestyle knock out the pin like for multiple seconds in a row, I felt like, and, and all those negative thoughts that were kind of holding me back from wanting to go through the, that, like those negative thoughts before that match, like, we're just like, shit, like, what, a, like, I was just like very, I couldn't turn that moment around. Like he got off his back, he came at me right away. And it was just like the momentum shifted immediately. I, I had him on his back for 30 seconds. And then I ended up getting teched the next minute. Like it was just, wow. it was definitely a mental thing that, I'm not ending my career on that for sure. I'm coming back way harder and 
uh, having a much better performance than ending my career on that. But hats off to Evan, man. He fought off his back hard. Mm. He got to his attacks, kept going, and that's the kind of matches he wrestles, man. He'll get into the he'll get into those scraps, and he finds a way to win. Dude, so, he wrestles really hard. Yeah, so like off, really hard. He's crafty. He's right. super crafty, and he wrestles hard. I think he barnstorms a lot of people. I think they're like. People forget about that guy or something. It's really weird because I'm like, yeah. that guy is good. Yeah, and the match I did beat him a couple months before that, it was a scrap as well. And it was like positions where you feel like you're dominating and then all of a sudden he's scoring a push out on you by hipping in as hard as he can or something, taking your shoulder off. Rubber right. leg, running yeah. out, blast doubling you, something crazy, or he scrambles yeah. weird. Um, he, he rolls through a gut wrench, extra hard pins. What, so he did that to somebody at the duels. Yeah, he's crazy. He's yeah. yeah, he wrestles really hard. Uh, is there a match at the you know match series of matches that you look? You know, obviously the one that I look at is I've never seen a better game plan than what Dake did to Burroughs. It was incredible. Yeah, that I was unreal. Did that I, shock I, you at all? I wouldn't say it shocked me. I just, you know, you know Jordan Burroughs to me is a, a, Re- a Mount Rushmore figure of our sport in America. Like. Like he's a king to me and uh, coming from Jersey, especially, you know, he wasn't the most dominant in New Jersey. He barely won a state title when he did win one. And then he went on to the only school that really took a chance on him and believed in it. And he freaking made it happen and look at his results now and his accomplishments. So it's hard to bet against a guy like that, but you know, I've been able to feel Kyle Dake for the last couple of years in different training situations. And it did not shock me that that happened because he is phenomenal in every position he's the only guy in like the 20 pound range that I've ever wrestled like 20 pounds for me that I feel like when I, anything I do, it, I just get embarrassed. Like, like, you know, you have that <laughs> feeling when you're a little kid and you're 70 pounds wrestling the high school kid, that's a hundred, but that's how wrestling him to me felt the last couple of times. And I was just like, yo, like, I don't know, man. How is some, how do people score on this guy? Like I get to his legs. Nobody get, does. Cause nobody legs, does I forward. I don't get to his legs. I get forward. Like yeah. it's crazy. <laughs> the chest dude, the chest wrap that he does. Yeah. And then how there he plants is. his feet. Yeah, it yeah. is ridiculous. I mean, in training, he'll like let you get him to his butt just to chest lock you all the way up, throwing you over your shoulder. And a similar guy that wrestles like that in practice, I felt like similar was Chimizo. Like, yeah. He just those two guys are just not the same as other wrestlers. You know, they're not doing techniques that you learn in the PIL building, the South playing field. You know, they're uh, they're just more natural, I'd say for sure. But they just understand how bodies move. I think a little bit better than some leverage, of us. right? And leverage, yeah, leverage. Yeah, and he's always hitting a chin whip step over and scoring on the best guys yeah. in the world. Their body kinetics are on a whole nother level, just like you're saying. Like their body kinetics and their body awareness is incredible. And I think it helps Kyle Dake that mom and dad were both uh, Kent State athletes. Yeah, Do you know his dad was a, his dad a was an All-American way. at Kent State? Did you know that? I didn't know that. Yeah, Doug Dake was uh, seventh for Kent State at 177. Yeah, but you, it's funny because, you know, you see the things Dake's been doing the last couple of years with, like, the functional patterns. And um, obviously, you know, wrestlers are going to want to know what the secret is, but you kind of see in the last couple of months Jordan Burroughs doing some of that stuff. And I thought that was interesting. It's like – you see, not that he was doing functional patterns, but he's doing different things with the way he was lifting and the videos he was putting out about that. Um, and from a, like, that's when I, that's th- the things that for me as a, not just as a wrestler, but in the community, I become a fan of those kind of things. Like I'm looking at that, like, Oh dang, like he's kind of doing what Dake's doing. Like, I wonder if that's uh, he feels like that's Dake's edge or something. Um, and it's something I thought about, like I would have these injuries, like, Oh shoot. Like Dake had some of these injuries and um you know, he turned it around and, and I was listening to Dake's interview with Chel Sonnen and I was talking about it before, but he mentions like, yeah, I, I trained with Burroughs for the worlds in 2011 and the world cup in 12. And it's like, I kind of forget they've been competing for 10 years, not eight, nine, 10 years. Like I'm in my second year doing this, like looking at them and someone like Dake, he's overcome a lot of the obstacles maybe I'm going through right now and, and made it happen for himself. And um, there's a lot of other athletes like that. And, um, they're inspirations for me. So I look at them guys and I'm like, dang, like I definitely have more in me. I could do more. I could switch it up and maybe train better if there's different ways like they're like they're doing out there. What's next for you and your partner with Mob and, Mob and Media Media? I uh, I think we're gonna be doing something pretty cool, maybe teaming up uh with 
the Wisconsin guys and Bono built and doing maybe like a dual meet between maybe like a team mob and team Bono built. Um, so that's kind of in the works right now and sometime in June. So that would be, I believe it's going to be a middle school team. We're going to have a little powwow about it tomorrow, actually. So um, hopefully there's more details to come soon, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be like a middle school little dual meet event with the middle school tournament following it. Um, and we kind of organize our own teams and try to beat each other. So it'll be cool because the Dragon National Tournament we had was a bunch of studs and some of the studs came to both, but some of the studs that came to ours didn't go to theirs and vice versa. So it, like we can make a decision maybe to keep it within the tournaments that we each had and like pick a little all-star team between that, which would be cool too. Um, we haven't really had a phone call where we got all the details together. We're just kind of going back and forth on it right now. So that's the next thing. And um, for me personally, it's figuring out what that next step's going to look like. Uh, how involved can I be in this mob and media thing? I'm sure I won't be able to um, be at these events where there's recruitable athletes and there's going to be different rules for me if I'm an assistant coach at a college. So um, I'm pretty positive I'll be able to still work with all the kindergarten through eighth grade guys, and that won't be a problem. So uh, for now, the focus is going to be doing those kind of events and kind of taking it month to month to see where, like what I'm able to do. What does Eliezer do? Like, as far as like, does he, he just do everything? So these, this tournament's like called, I'm, um, um, the last tournament, the dragon nationals, I'm looking at our results. Like his club is called, uh, the dragons. Like that's his name of his club in New Jersey. Um, he calls it the, the dragon RTC. Um, and it's, it's a kid's club, but it's a lot of really good quality guys, but, um, it's not like a numbers club, you know, he does small group private lessons and he does do bigger classes, maybe like eight to 12 guys, but he tries to keep the practices guys around the same weight class. And it's all guys like not, um, not actually Seth Mendoza, but it's guys of that quality in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, wow. New York area. And he works with really, really good kids. Um, Harvey Luddington's an eighth grader. That's number one in the country. He, he's one of his main guys. Uh, you know, Slater Hicks has come out to train with him many times. He's a stud. Slater Hicks just beat Gray Burnett in a two out of three from yeah, California. Slater, Slater Hicks took second at our tournament, actually. Yeah, um, he beat wow. uh, one of our one of our Ohio studs, uh, Gray Burnett, in a two out of three. Yeah. Because Cooper he's Hilton, California, right? Cooper Hilton took sixth in our tournament. He just won it. Oh, my God. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Anthony, him, couple, when we're talking those younger ages, right? Like, you know, you were a four-time state champ in New Jersey. How do you keep it in perspective? How do you, you know, like, what would be your advice to parents? What would, you, would your advice be to kids? Yeah. Whenever we're talking about these young athletes, man, like it's, I know that was, it's something that like I've heard like Lou Roselli say about the Stevers, man, you can only start that car so many times, right? Like yeah. they've wrestled at such a high level for such a long time. Like Logan Stever, for example, yeah. you wrestled at a high level for a really long time. How do you get longevity? How, you know, how do you build a love for a sport, the sport, you know, like this is, I'm asking yeah. you as like a dad, Yeah, no, I build the I, love for it. How do you know, not be a psycho parent. How do you do that stuff? I love the way my parents uh, treated my athletics in general. They wanted me playing two to three sports, my whole youth career into high school. And even in high school, like my mom was like really pushing for me not to give up baseball. I played my freshman year and I wanted to just wrestle so bad. Like, like that was my obvious best sport, man. I, maybe I was good enough to play, start on fr freshman team, start on JV, and then maybe be a starter my junior, senior year if I played baseball. But obviously I was a wrestler and I was going to try to be a wrestler through my college um, career at least. Um, and it was like me arguing with my mom to, and dad to try to let me to stop playing baseball. Um, they made me like kind of, not made me, but they really were like, you should at least play golf if you're not going to play baseball. So I ended up playing golf for my last three years of high school, but those just those things of playing those other sports not only made me love wrestling when wrestling came around more uh, as a kid, but it was just like made me a full athlete, made me have more quality times with my friends and create those friendships and bonds. Like, I mean, I'm just at a bachelor party. I'm 25 and I'm at a bachelor party with kids that I've played Pop Warner football with since I've been six, seven, eight years old. Like those are cool experiences that I, I'll never forget. And um, you know, those are very positive times in my life. So I think that was a big role. Like just let me explore my talents in other ways, not just wrestling, not just pushing wrestling. Uh, I didn't, 
I was in a unique situation where I was able to develop in wrestling because my town was so good and I had so many good athletes around me, but they didn't like, I didn't go to a club till I was maybe in sixth, seventh grade was the first time. And I was wrestling since five years old. And even then it was like once on Sunday or once a week. So like it was, it was all a local. It was, a it was all local. Everything you did yeah. was local. For me. Yeah. We, we created dual teams that went to Memorial day duels. That was our whole town as kids, or we would join other teams just to go get the competitions. Uh, we didn't do many things outside of our group until sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Then some of us started going to different clubs, triumph wrestling clubs. Some guys went to, which is in uh, like where I'm living right now. And, uh, I went to Apex a lot and I worked with Damian Logan private lessons a lot. I went to Shore Thing a lot because they were great training partners there and great training there as well. Um, I went to Elite Wrestling Club, Steve Rivera, Sebastian Rivera's dad ran that. Um, I hit all the clubs, man. I, I think some people thought I was a, like a club whore, they would call it, just because, <laughs> just because like I didn't go to any clubs growing up. So it was more about the, where the training partners were at. If, did you if do Ryan, Tulsa? Did you do Tulsa? I did Tulsa Reno? one time and I did Reno one time. And I did took you win sec- I took second at Reno. I got crushed by Jack Hathaway. I don't know if you know me. He wrestled for Oregon State under uh, yeah. Coach Roberts. Yeah. Um, I got him back in college, but he got <laughs> <laughs> And then I, I went to Tulsa when I was 12 and under uh, 76 pounds and I won that. I think I remember seeing a picture of you and Danny Hodge. I'm not joking. Wearing, and I was wearing a Penn State singlet. I love it. Um, <laughs> but that was like still like it was like three of the kids from South Plainfield. We went together. I didn't go wrestling under like the club or anything. It was my town at 12 and under. And that was about the time I started training with maybe Damien Logan doing privates or different people. Uh, Is Damien outside. Logan a Michigan guy or am I making that yeah, up? Yeah, he was a Michigan All-American for them. I think he took um, third for Michigan, didn't he? Not positive what he plays. He's all seven. American for Michigan. I want to say seventh, but I'm not positive on that. Yeah, I'm wrong a lot. Is fully doubted Jersey guy? Yeah, he is. And he helped out at that club as well. Yeah. Uh, this guy, Eric Norgard, he wrestled for Columbia. Um, I love it. A couple other guys. I love the it. thick Jersey. Just like it is, it is so. We have the same culture of like these guys who just don't get out of wrestling. And at some capacity, they stick around. It's, I love that. I think that's a good thing. Some people get down on people like that and they call them wrestling hobos. I, I, I am not one of them, but like, you know what I mean? Like people who are just like, it's in their blood and they love yeah. it and they can't, they can't let it go. And I, you know, I'm a fan of that. I like that. I think that's what builds the culture. And if you, we talk to Tig more and he says, that's the big thing about PA is you got all those small schools that got wrestling and their teacher schools. And then you have guys that go back and teach that high level wrestling to middle school and high schoolers. Yeah, that's why PA is what it is because Definitely. all those schools had it. And those, I think that's a great theory on Pennsylvania. But last thing I've got for you, and Jared might have something, but how Jared, important- does Jared work at a club or run a club? I, I coach at a high school. Oh, uh, what high school? Uh, Sandusky St. Mary's, very, okay. very small school. So I coach there, and uh, my brother coached the youth side there, and uh, really small school, under 100 boys in the whole high school. Shoot. Yeah. Crazy. Is that where you yeah. went? Yeah. Yeah. I went there. My brother graduated. I was 99. My brother was 01. He graduated with 15 boys in his class and in, in the, you know, one state. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. Are you, a, are you a teacher there as well now? No, I run the, actually the youth, uh, we'll have to talk off air. I actually run the youth uh, organization here in Ohio that does the junior high and uh, grade school state. Oh, awesome. That tournament. I think I follow that tournament more than the high school state tournament. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like when I was a kid, that was the shit. <laughs> oh, see, yeah. We'll have to, uh, to talk off air, try to get some. Uh, yeah. I actually, going. the one, the one tournament I always went to was my brother always went to, and I got the wrestle because they have the young divisions was Ohio tournament champions. DOC. Yeah. It was just, That's how I, I got moved it. West Virginia. Really? Yeah. Can't, can't be called the OTC then. Nah, nah. DOC, yeah. <laughs> that was a precursor to what we're doing pretty much. So, yeah. Yeah, so Jared's tournament is the standard in um, our youth and our junior high state championships. They do grade school state championships, and they do the junior high. And they wear and, their, uh, the singlets designated from, like, their areas, right? That's PA. That's PA. Oh, yeah. You guys don't do that, too, or have final we just do, uh, finalists? We do, yeah. We have finalists. Barbarian Apparel, dude. You're on the Barbarian Hour. Dude, I'm just – I'm thinking back to, like – Michael Jordan wrestling in it. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They they had no. They've been they've been doing finalist singlets. Geez, you guys been doing finalist singlets for junior high guys since, since oh, forever. Four oh four, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah 04, yeah, 03, 04. 04 for uh, sure. But yeah, it's Barbarian Apparel, and that's obviously you're on the Barbarian Hour. And then you guys wear New Jersey RTC. You wear Barbarian Apparel. But yeah, Barbarian Apparel. Um, I believe so. And um, you know, Pat Downey is not with us anymore, but he was Barbarian Apparel. Tyler Graff. So we got Barbarian Apparel for for sure up in there. Yeah, Tyler was just here in Ohio last. He did a clinic, right? Yeah, yeah. Down yeah. at the VA at center. the Barbarian Center. Nice. Jared, looks, what's our like code? A, is what's that a warehouse code? or just a wrestling room? It's his uh, like headquarters, so he has his office there. It's headquarters, yeah. Two it's locker everything. rooms, sauna, two like two workout areas. It, wow. Yeah, it's his headquarters, Cincinnati, There's, down in Cincinnati. It's like are so. they running any practices out of there besides camps and clinics? Yep. Yeah, they do. Um, like a Sunday night club. open mats. I think uh, Sunday nights for sure. You know, they got a couple yeah. colleges down that way. Um, and then yeah, there's there's Sunday nights, and then um, yes. Uh, Clinicians coming in every month. They just announced Hancock's coming in. What so, is our code, Jared? If we want uh, Barbarian to... Apparel slash BA Hour, and there's a, a singlet deal. So use the uh, code. Use the code. I just go to that link. That link. Yeah, BA Hour. Oh yeah, you're gonna have the link on the show here. Okay, Mob, and I got one more for you. Ready? Shoot. You staying at Rutgers? You took this massive leap of faith and scott goodell and staff and nobody dude nobody on the national landscape thought you could get it done there to give everybody a big old i don't even want to say it but you know just just <laughs> prove, you know how i want to say it, but just proving people long and wrong and just giving them a big old turd burger yeah what was it like for you to just be able to stick it to people and show that you could get it done at Rutgers and, and you, and obviously you and Nick Soriano winning the titles in the first, you know, together to be the first two champs for Rutgers and how you guys finished and sticking around a sixth year. And it's like a Cinderella story, man, what you did, but to stick around there and get the job done there and show kids you can win in New Jersey. What was that like for you to stay there? Yeah, like you, you said, it's a Cinderella story. Like it, it felt like a fairy tale. It felt like, um, like that's what I went there to do. And it's like not many people get to accomplish what they want to do. And like I got to be a national champ at school and go through the process of stinking and finishing thirty second in the country, having Anthony Parati punch through as an All American for Goodale for the first time, and being able to follow that up after I met you and have my own journey was just like, I saw the process of the team change and the culture change and the rules change for the athletes, the coaches change in and out had Frank Monero and then Donnie Pritzoff came in and introduced a whole new side of things that maybe we didn't even know at that point, or just a different learning curve, different way of doing things. And um, to be a part of that process was also a separate fairy tale. Um, it was just like, awesome you know that's the reason why i would really like to coach there because i want to keep developing that and pushing that to the next level and you know the next step for us would be to break farther into the top 10 to break into the top five to send guys to the olympics on team usa and send guys to world championships and have a full functioning rtc of our own like those are the next goals for our program so um to do what i did is great and i see it even farther like i i've always thought we could in, right in New Jersey, like you guys in Ohio have so much talent and Ohio State kind of represents the same thing. We have so much talent. It's it's like endless what we could do here if, if we really develop um, what we're capable of getting these athletes and of course taking other athletes from other states as well, but really honing in on how to develop these Jersey athletes from young all the way through college, how to keep the best ones at home, um, how to want them to come at stay at home, which is showing them that we have a great product, putting 7,000 people in the rack, winning all American national championships, um, placing high at the national tournament, having great RTC athletes. Like that's all part of being that program, you know, all the best programs, Penn state has like 15 RTC athletes, I think right now, like maybe more, <laughs> I don't even know. Right. Um, Michigan cliff Keen RTC. They have about like 10 athletes right now. Like these schools it's not just about like the results anymore it's also about there's there's Bo Bassett's out there that thinks he's going to be an Olympic champ when he's 18 and I'm not I didn't mean to say like things like he can't get done like he really probably believes that and he's looking at probably his college program like where can I get that done like where who, who's going to put me in that situation the best and 
the reason I picked Rutgers is because I had a lot of comfort, uh, comfortability with them that they would lead me in the best path to getting it done, which I feel like they, we did. We accomplished that goal. We showed we could do that. Um, but not many kids are willing to take that risk unless it's ideal situation. And for me, the full picture would be to get it to that ideal situation, get it to that point where this is going to be never ending. I love it. I love the supreme confidence. I love the supreme confidence and I love that you got it done. That's what's awesome about it. We Thanks, could man. see sit here being shoulda, woulda, coulda type stuff. Ah, you know, I got, I got eighth, I got fourth, I got six. Yeah, the you know, last year wasn't meant for me. Yeah. Oh man, you just st- you just stayed the freaking course. Yeah, it was important. Man. I love it. And it was better. I love it. it was better. Like, of course, I said it before I wanted to be the first national champ. That was a goal, but like Nick was the first. And it was just bittersweet because we had two and it was just back to back. We were two to four time New Jersey state champs. It was awesome. Like, of course I still wanted to be the first one, but I was just freaking happy. Like I love Rutgers that much that I was still so happy. Like there was nothing that was going to bring any positivity down. Like it was a thing in the back of my, like, yeah, I wanted to be first, but it was the whole picture, man. Like if I, maybe if I didn't go to Rutgers and do what I did, I don't know if Nick Soriano would transfer home to Rutgers. Like would Sebastian Rivera ever come home to Rutgers? Like all these people, like, in the end, I do feel a little bit uh, happy and confident that that is a goal that I got to check off. Like I started that process in giving not just these five-year-olds and eight-year-olds and 10, 12-year-olds belief that they could get it done in New Jersey, going through a public school and going through the state tournament and going to their local university. Um, But I also showed guys like Nick Soriano and Sebastian, I'd like to believe that they could come do it too. Very few people could just, check that off right that's yeah. awesome i love it can i leave the last thing i want to leave you with is a good new jersey holler can i give you it yep new jersey <laughs> <laughs> so oh, you gotta give me a, yeah. you gotta give me a schnalty be mobbing dude all right all right but i don't know if i could give it to that much pop right now you know it's supposed to be the barbarian hour. It's the barbarian hour in, a, in 45 minutes. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> We're right. good, Jared. You got anything busting else for your chops. I'm, busting. No, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks, man. I'll be mobbing. <laughs> Hello, wrestlers and coaches. I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the Division I level in the NCAA, 15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that, to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below, and we can set up your first consultation today. I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice.